Let's open our Bibles to the book of Nehemiah and continue our story of how this man, who was the cupbearer to the king of Persia, became the Persian Jewish governor of the Jewish homelands with a commission to rebuild the city of Jerusalem's walls. We know that this is all taking place in the early part of 444 BC, the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, and that Nehemiah arrived at the city of Jerusalem somewhere in the latter part of the fourth Jewish month, which means in that particular year, we're talking about later July, pretty much the time of year that we're first broadcasting this teaching. And so he goes on a little private inspection tour on the third day of his arrival. He does it at night because he wants this to be very private. Uh, He checks out the uh, western side of the ancient city of David, which is the oval hill of Yabus or Jabus that David had taken over as his city of Jerusalem. So he checks out that uh, western wall between the valley gate in the north and the dung gate in the south. Then he goes around the southern end of the city of David and checks out uh, the king's pool, which is the pool of Siloam, and the fountain gate that's right there next to it, and then apparently goes up along the eastern side of the ancient city of David, Uh, in the Kidron Valley. Uh, It's a little bit tough going. He can't take his animal with him, that is his donkey or his horse, because of debris or perhaps uh, undergrowth. But he does check out a little bit more of the wall on that side. Uh, And then he comes back and he gets himself ready to reveal to the other leaders and the people of Jerusalem his plan and the commission that he has gained from the king, which is to rebuild the walls. So now we're ready for that. Nehemiah chapter number 2, verse 17. This is the day after his nighttime inspection. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. And remember, we were talking about this idea that Uh, You could probably still see the footprint of the wall all around uh, the ancient city of Jerusalem. Uh, But you could also see the burned places, uh, maybe the charred remains of the different gates. Uh, So nothing is there to really protect the city. It's just the ruined line of the wall. He says, come. Let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. So the time has come to rebuild the wall. Now Ezra, I am sure, is in the crowd that day. He had come back 13 years earlier with a commission from the same king. Uh, And that commission gave him permission to do whatever it was that he felt was appropriate from the word of God. And he started rebuilding the walls at that time, but legal challenges were instantly raised against him. And King Artaxerxes sent him a follow-up message that he needed to stop building the wall until he gave specific permission to do so. So Ezra has spent almost a dozen years uh, with his project suspended. And now he's about to hear that the king has told Nehemiah, you can start the project again. Verse number 18. I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So he explains to them, that the king has given him specific permission, actually directive, to rebuild these walls. And the people's response is, let's do it. 
Let's get this done. So they strengthen their hands for the good work. But when Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite servant, and Geshem, the Arab, heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us. So these are three of the non-Israeli leaders of the Middle East. Uh, They seem to be headquartered out of Samaria to the north, uh, and they don't like the Jewish people. Uh, They don't like the Jewish people succeeding at repopulating their homelands, and now they're not happy that they've been given a commission to rebuild the walls. So they start mocking them, but also threatening them with political action based on assumptions that they're making. Let's listen to that. They jeered at us and despised us and said, What is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? So their idea is, you Jews are planning on reinforcing your ancient capital city. And once you have those walls rebuilt, you're going to declare your independence from King Artaxerxes. You're going to declare your independence from the Persian Empire, aren't you? That's what you plan on doing. Verse number 20. Then I replied to them, The God of heaven will make us prosper, and we his servants will arise and build. So his response is, just effectively, God's blessing us in this. We're going to get this job done. And then you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. So effectively, this is none of your business. You are not Israelis. You are not followers of the one true God. This is none of your concern. So effectively, Nehemiah is saying, you need to just back off, mind your own business. This is Jewish business. Chapter number three. Now, chapter number three is going to include a whole bunch of names, which don't get all worried about that. Uh, Best thing you can do with a Jewish name is pronounce it as best you can and move on. All right. Uh, And uh, there's also going to be some geographical information, which I love because having been in Jerusalem three different times now on three different trips, uh, I've experienced a lot of this topography firsthand. Uh, and by the way, I'm going to make this mention again. Uh, we're planning another trip for October of 2023. So more than a year into the future yet. Uh, and if you are interested in going on that trip and maybe seeing some of these places, walking some of these places that we're going to be describing today uh, for yourself, then you uh, check out the website, intotheword.net, find the hot link for the trip information, and see if maybe uh, you can go with us. So chapter number three. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests. So this is the guy that's functioning as the high priest at the time. So these guys rose up and they built the sheep gate. Now we're pretty certain the general vicinity of where the Sheep Gate's located because of the New Testament, Gospel of John, chapter number five story, which talks about uh, the pool of uh, Bethsaida being, or uh, Bethsaida being near the Sheep Gate. Uh, And we know exactly where that pool's at. The archaeological ruins are right there. I've seen it myself. Uh, It's on... Uh, just above the uh, northeast corner of the the Temple Mount area. And so somewhere up in that region, not far uh, from uh, the pool of Bethsaida, or Bethesda, I I keep saying that incorrectly, sorry, the pool of Bethesda, uh, probably a little bit south of there, is where the Sheep Gate would have been located. And uh, From this point, we're going to go uh, counterclockwise to the left around Jerusalem. 
And that's how uh, he's going to describe these different places. So that's where they began their part of the building project. They consecrated it and set its doors. Now that'll happen once uh, all of the uh, stonework is in place, then they'll put the wooden doors in place. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hananel. So those two towers are somewhere in that same general vicinity along the wall line. And so those guys underneath the high priest are taking care of that region of the wall work. Verse 2, next to him, meaning off to the west, the men of Jericho built. So some people living in Jericho came up for this project. Next to them, Zakur the son of Imri built. And what we see here is that Nehemiah's plan is we're going to build this entire wall in a very short period of time. And so we're going to have a whole bunch of work crews working at the exact same moment all over the place. And so each work crew uh, has connections to themselves. And so they take a certain section and they focus on building it and tying in with the people next to them. And so that's what we're going to see all along through this chapter. Verse number three, the sons of Hassanah built the fish gate. Uh, now this gate must have been pretty much directly north from the temple building. And so it's along the wall on the north side. They laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. Uh, next to them, Meremoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakoth, repaired. And then next to them, Meshulam, the son of Berakia, son of Meshuzabel, repaired. Next to them, Zadok, the son of Bana, repaired. Next to them, the Tekoites, uh, the Tekoites repaired but their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. Now, Tekoa is a city to the south of Bethlehem a little ways. And so these guys came up uh, as a, a local building crew to work on this section on the north wall. And we're told here, apparently some of their wealthier uh, people didn't bother to come up because they felt that was below them or beneath them to work on the, the walls of the city. Verse 6, Jehoiada, the son of Paseah, and Meshulam, the son of Besodiah, repaired the gate of Yashana. Now, Yashana uh, gate seems to be a gate heading north, uh, uh, probably... Uh, out of the area immediately west of the temple complex. Uh, it's heading toward the city of Mitzpah, where past Jewish governors of Judah had lived. And that means, unsurprisingly, that some of the people from that area are engaged in building this section of the wall. And we actually see them uh, mentioned in the next uh, couple of sentences. Uh, now, this gate, many of these gates, we have no clear archaeological evidence as to where they're at uh, now. Uh, this gate's probably somewhere in the bazaars of the Muslim quarter today, probably somewhere a little bit uh, east of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, so they laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars, and next to them repaired Melatea the Gibeonite. Gibeon would be north out of this particular gate area. And Yadon the Merathite, uh, the men of Gibeah and of Mitzpah, the seat of the governor of the province of the river, or, or province beyond the river. So again, these guys would have only lived a few miles to the north and a little bit west of this particular work area. So they're working on it as part of their devotion to God. Verse 8, Next to them, Uziel, the son of Har, uh, Harhaya, goldsmiths, repaired. 
Uh, next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers, repaired, and they restored the Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Now, there is a gate missing in this part of the story for some reason. Don't know why. Uh, maybe it was one of the things that uh, Ezra had already worked on, and so it didn't really need annotated as being worked on. Uh, it's the Ephraim Gate. Now, Ephraim is the place to the north of Judah, uh, past Benjamin. Uh, and so this gate is probably so named because it heads off that direction. Uh, but the broad wall that's mentioned here, that is, uh, interestingly enough, the name that's given by modern archaeologists to a wall section built by King Hezekiah uh, during his time when he enclosed uh, a part of western Jerusalem, uh, that is, just immediately west of the temple complex, to uh, uh, barricade against any incursions by the Assyrians. Uh, so he was doing a lot of work on Jerusalem at that time, including the building of the Hezekiah Tunnel and the Siloam Pool. And so here is the broad wall that's also built. I've seen uh, uh, about a 70-yard section of this that's been unearthed. Uh, it's over in the Jewish quarter, not very far from the bathrooms that are near, uh, the public bathrooms that are near the great synagogue uh, that's there in the Jewish uh, quarter. Uh, it's given the name Broad Wall because it is broad. It's about 21 feet wide. So that's pretty broad for most walls. And uh, evidently, this wall footprint uh, was known to Nehemiah. And so he mentions how they tie their wall building efforts into at least some section of this broad wall of Hezekiah that's on the west side of uh, the western uh, residential area uh, to the west of, of the Temple Mount. And so, the next thing that we're told, next to them, Rephiah the son of Hur, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired. Next to him, Jediah the son of Harumph, uh, repaired opposite his house. And that's interesting. A lot of these guys, it's cited that they volunteered to work on a section close to where they were already living. Next to him, Hatush, the son of Hashabaniya, uh, repaired uh, Malka, Malkia, the son of Harim, and Hashub, the son of Hahat Moab, repaired another section and the Tower of the Ovens. Now, why it's named the Tower of the Ovens, I don't know. Could be that there were some bakers that worked in that particular area. Could be that this might be a smelting region. Uh, but whatever the reason is, uh, this area is called the Tower of the Ovens. Uh, this, we've now are probably talking about places uh, that are in the Armenian quarter of the, uh, of the modern old city of Jerusalem. Next to him, Shalom, the son of Halohesh, ruler of half of the district of Jerusalem, repaired he and his daughters. Hanun and the, and by the way, you notice that we've got the whole family that's involved in some of this. Uh, the kids are coming out. The young ladies are coming out and helping rebuild. Hanun and the inhabitants of Zanoah repaired the valley gate. Now, we've talked about the valley gate when we were looking at the inspection night tour that uh, Nehemiah did three days after he arrived. Uh, I believe the valley gate must be somewhere close to where the modern dung gate is located. The modern dung gate is the southern access point to the western wall plaza. So it's south uh, and west of uh, the Temple Mount. And it sits on kind of a, a wide uh, topographical feature that goes east and west, uh, and uh, it is the dividing line uh, between, th that is this, this, this wide place, it's the dividing place between the most ancient part of Jerusalem, which is the city of David to the south, and the Solomonic, 
area to the north uh, that was added when he became king. That is, uh, his palace area, his administrative area, and then the Temple Mount to the north of that. Uh, So the valley gate seems to have been the gate uh, at the midpoint between the two sections of Jerusalem. And it faced the valley uh, uh, called the the Cheesemakers Valley or the uh, Tyropean Valley uh, that goes along the western side of the ancient city of David. And so that's the one that, that's who's working on the valley gate right now. They rebuild it, set its walls, its bolts, and its bars. And then they repaired a thousand cubits of the wall as far as the dung gate. Now, why is this important? Because the thousand cubits helps affirm to us where these gates are in relationship to each other. We're pretty sure the general vicinity of where the dung gate's at because it's close to the uh, convergence of the uh, Gehenna, Tyropean, and Kidron valleys. It is close to the Pool of Siloam. And so this passage is telling us that the valley gate is about a thousand cubits north from there. That's 1,500 feet. And if you go 1,500 feet north from where we think the Dung Gate was located, you have arrived right around the more modern Dung Gate of the old city of Jerusalem. And so that's why I think we can be pretty sure where the Valley Gate was located. Verse number 14, Malkia, the son of Rechab, uh, ruler of the district of Beth Hakarim repaired the dung gate. Now, this is the ancient dung gate uh, down by the Pool of Siloam area. Uh, he rebuilt it and it set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. So now we've reached the southern end of the ancient city of Jerusalem. Shalom, the son of Kolhaza, ruler of the district of Mizpah, repaired the fountain gate. The Fountain Gate is probably the southern and southeastern access point to the area of the Pool of Siloam. So he rebuilt it and he covered this gate and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And then he rebuilt the wall of the Pool of Shalah. Now that's the English Standard Version spelling, but it's basically Shalach which is the Hebrew name for the Pool of Siloam. So we know exactly where we're talking about because we've unearthed that archaeologically. We know where it's at. I've been there. I've walked down the pool stairs into the bottom of it. So I know exactly where it's at. And so this pool was the place that Hezekiah sent the diverted waters of, uh, of Gihon whenever he built it. And uh, so we know that there was a garden around it because it says he built the wall of the pool of Shaloah of the king's garden as far as the stairs that go down from the city of David. Now, the city of David stretches northward from here along this oval hill uh, until they reach the palace area of King David uh, on the north end of the city of David. And so there were stairs that apparently went up from the pool of Siloam up to the Uh, northern end of this oval-shaped hill. Those stairs were later uh, renovated uh, to go all the way up to the Temple Mount. And the archaeologists are actually unearthing those those first century stairs, and I've walked up a a little bit of that flight of stairs myself. So (laughs) whenever I read this passage, I am picturing the exact topography and some of the exact architecture Uh, that Nehemiah and his guys were building. Verse number 16. After him, Nehemiah, the son of Azbuk, ruler of half the district of Bethzur, repaired to a point opposite the tombs of David. Now, when you go to Jerusalem today, uh, there's going to be all sorts of uh, touristy things that point to the tomb of David being uh, over on a hill on the west side of the city of Jerusalem, uh, up near the Herodian palace, uh, which was 
which is referred to in the in the local local uh, touristy stuff as being the citadel of David. Total misnomer, but that's how it gets talked about. Uh, the tomb of David that they show you uh, is in close proximity to the supposed upper room that they show you, which is definitely not the upper room because all of that was destroyed in AD 70. But that's what they do with tourists. They uh, send them to all sorts of places that are not exactly accurate. But the authentic tombs of David have not yet been unearthed. But this passage tells us the general vicinity where they're at. And uh, I can tell you that they must be somewhere near this green space that is north of the Pool of Siloam. Uh, The green space has been left uh, for... Uh, the archaeological park for the city of David, so that you can kind of view the ancient Canaanite and some Israeli walls that are right there on the hillside. And so probably right in that vicinity is where the tombs of David were located, just north of the Pool of Siloam and south of where the Gihon Spring was located. Uh, So here's some builders working on their section of the wall right there along the eastern side of the city of David. And they went as far as the artificial pool and as far as the house of the mighty men. Remember that David had mighty men that worked for him. So apparently there was some sort of hall that they either used when they were alive or which was named after them that was, had been located in that general vicinity of the ancient city of Jerusalem. And then after him, the Levites repaired Rehum, the son of Bani, next to him, Hashabiah, ruler of half the district of Kailia, uh, repaired for his district. And so we just see those repeated names of those working their section of the wall on behalf of people from their area. Come back tomorrow and we will finish the rest of the building of the wall.